we thank you for the revelations of your Holy Spirit that we receive here as well. Oh, Lord, guide us as we think this morning on these topics that are so pressing at this point in time. And help us, O oh God, to be truly hospitable and welcoming people in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie. Good morning. If I need it, just there we go. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with a little bit of disclaimer in that I have no business being up here teaching about um, uh, what it means to be transgender or gay or uh, anything along the spectrum except cisgender. Um, keep in mind that all of us are somewhere on that spectrum because cisgender is a, part of, is a part of the spectrum. And that's where I fall, which is um, assigned female at birth, female on my birth certificate, consider myself female, probably always will consider myself female and very much heterosexual. Now, having made that disclaimer, I'm also, I'm going to stray just a little bit from the book and from the scripture, um, not, not too far outside the lines, but um, because what has happened, let me tell you, I don't have a, a, a an outline for you this week. I don't do PowerPoint as people who know me, my teaching style know. Um, what I do have is I have lived and read and eaten and slept with this book for the last few weeks, especially. And uh, what I can tell you is my perspective and how this book has affected my journey and hope that that is something that other people will find helpful. So it is all coming out of the book, but not necessarily in such a, an orderly fashion. It's, uh, it's a little bit jumbled because so are my thoughts. Um, I want to start by reading again the premise of our class, which is Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. That is where we took the name for this class, Wonderfully Made. Um, and one of the most important things that I have learned in this study is approach. And that is we and that's a very general read, have a tendency to say, I know what to do and swoop in and do it. And it's often not the right thing. What I have learned the most from reading these books is that our task, our first calling is to listen. To listen to what people in a situation that I personally cannot, cannot understand because I haven't lived it. Um, to listen to what they tell us about their situation and to tell us, this is what I need. Now, um, let's be, be honest here. I can't understand the situation of anyone in this room because I am not you. And that's an important thing. Um, your situation is different from your situation, which is different from your situation, which is different from your situation. And that's just a fact of life. There are billions of people on this earth and they're all unique. So all we can do is try to understand what we are told and respect and love. And that's where I'm coming from. So 
I, I want to start, I did <laughs> this morning, which is why I probably gave a couple of heart attacks by running in the door at 926. Uh, <laughs> this morning, uh, after dreaming last night um, that I was teaching this class, I did finally get something written down on paper for myself that said, don't forget to go in this order so you don't leave out that. Um, and I'm going to start with names. Names are gifts. We gift our child with a name. Um, that name says so much about what we hope for our child or what we see in our child, or it says something about our heritage that we want to pass on to our child. Names are important and they are gifts. And maybe one of the hardest things that parents of uh, trans people have, uh, 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 poor parents of trans people, is that their children want to change their names. And we picked out those names so carefully, and they are precious, and they were gifts from us to our children. And it can feel like our children are rejecting us when they reject the name that we gave them. Um, I want to kind of equate that with the two-year-old's no. You know, um, we've all experienced that, whether or not we even have children. The two-year-old says no, because the two-year-old is learning that I am not you. When our children change their names, so often it's because they have recognized a part of themselves that there was no way for parents to know at birth. Um, it doesn't mean that they have rejected who they are as much as it is that they have taken on something more. Names are, are gifts from our parents. Names are sometimes gifts from God. Um, Jacob. When Jacob wrestled with the angel, and here, see, I am, it, it is biblically based. I am getting with the scripture. Um, no, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Um, Jacob uh, wrestled with God. We know the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel and Jacob they, they come to a standstill neither one of them defeats the other and Jacob and the angel says let go of me and Jacob says no I'm not going to bless me and how does the angel bless Jacob by giving him a new name Israel and throughout we hear about Jacob Israel they are, you know, from that point on, one of the same as far as names go. Um, and then Jacob says, will you tell me your name? And the angel says, uh, bye. <laughs> and, and instead cripples Jacob so that Jacob can't beat him. The angel won't give Jacob his name, even though he's just given Jacob a new name. And I'm going to get... To more of that in just a minute. Another great example, and there, there are lots of them, but I'm just picking out a couple, is that Jesus gives to Peter with a new name. Your name is no longer Simon. It is now Peter, because you are the Petra, the rock on which I build my church. Those are times where name changes are a gift from someone else. Names are also power. When we name something, we have a certain amount of power over it. Um, in mental health, we talk all about all the time about if you can name your fear, you can control it. Um, with a lot of work. <laughs> but, you know, if you can name something, you have a certain amount of control. If somebody comes in here and grabs my purse and runs out the door with it, hey, you, I'm calling the police. 
yeah, big deal. I'm gone long before the police get here. And but if, if on the other hand, um, Jack Jehoshaphat comes in and steals my purse, and I can say, Jack Jehoshaphat, you stop with my purse. I'm going to call the police and tell them what you did, and I'm going to tell your mother on you. That gives us a certain amount of power because we know the person's name. And by knowing their name, supposedly we know something about them. Well, I, I bring that up because when someone gives us their name, the name they have chosen for themselves, and that's often a very hard thing for transgender people or non-binary people to do is to give us their real name. They are making themselves vulnerable. And if we say, no, that's not your name, that's not, what I'm, that's not what's on your birth certificate, what we are in essence saying is, I don't respect you. I don't respect who you say you are. I only respect who I say you are. Um, and, and that's also why the angel won't tell Jacob the angel's name, by the way. Because if Jacob knows the angel's name, Jacob has the power of that angel. And the angel will give Jacob a new name, but will not give. No, no, I'm not giving you my name. Sorry. So one thing that I have learned is how important it is to respect the name that someone chooses for themselves. Um, names can also be labels, though. Um, you know, oh, well, you're a transgender. I know what you are. I can categorize you. I can put you in this pigeonhole and forget about you. Um, you're gay. That means you act thus and thus away and you feel thus and thus away. And so I know what you are. And that's so not true because one gay person and another gay person and one transgender person and another transgender person, they are unique and wonderfully made. Names can be used as labels. I'm going to give you, in the course of this class, I'm going to give you a couple of personal examples because they are examples that helped me understand better what he was saying, what Austin Hartley was saying in his book. Um, and in doing so, I will make myself a little bit vulnerable. I want to say that up front because if you say to me afterwards, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you, then I have missed my mark. Because all I want to do with that is to say, do you see how this is analogous to that? And how maybe this can help you understand that. And that's it. Um, when I was first ordained, I had a very dear, wonderful, person in this church come up to me and say, you need to go by Deborah now. And I said, but my name's Debbie. Yes, but you're a woman. And it's hard for a woman to get respect. And Deborah is more dignified. And I said, but it's not my name. And I, I looked at her and I said, Bob Lawrence doesn't have to go by Robert to be respected. Bob Peahoff doesn't have to go by Robert to be respected. Why do I need to change my name in order to be respected? If I have to change my name to be respected, then I am not being respected. Well, okay. Um, if the conversation had ended there and she continued to call me Debbie, we'd have been okay. But instead, she said, well, I just think you need to change your name because it's more dignified, to, to go by Deborah because it's more dignified. Well, my grandfather's the only person in this world who has ever been allowed to call me Deborah. Um, 
for one thing, my name is Deborah. It's three syllables, and even I don't pronounce it that way. But it grates on my ears when somebody calls me Deborah. That's spelled D E B R A, and it's not my name. Um, but this person said to me, Well, I'm going to call you Deborah, and I'm going to encourage my friends to call you Deborah. <laughs> and I said, And I'm not going to answer. <laughs> um, and to this day, that person calls me Deborah. And if she addresses me by name, I don't answer. If she says, I'm, new. I'm not trying to be petty about it. But if she says, if she says, good morning. Oh, good morning. How are you this morning? If she says, good morning, Deborah, walk on by. <laughs> it's not my name. And I don't give anyone else the right to choose my name. Except Bob. Um, from there, I want to go, I'm going to come back actually to that some, but from there, I want to go to pronouns. Because pronouns are a stumbling block for many of us. And up until about a year ago, they were a stumbling block for me. So this is how reading this material has changed my journey. Um, and also knowing people who go by the pronoun they and understanding why. That has changed my journey. And Austin Hartman talks a lot about this in the book. Now, rather than imposing our sets of expectations on people, when we use the pronouns that they wish us to use, we are respecting their definitions of themselves. Um, respecting people for who they are. Now, one argument though that I've heard, a little side argument is, yes, but they is a plural pronoun and my grammar just won't let me do that uh, when talking about a single individual. I have finally, and that was, that was my stance a year ago, confession time. Um, but I have come to a better understanding of that. Um, I still trip over it. I, I, I don't want to trip over it, but I do. But if thou dost not wish to use a plural pronoun for a single individual, then thou must stop addressing individuals as you. Because you is a plural pronoun. And for hundreds of years, we have used you to speak to individuals as well as groups. Other languages don't do that as much as we do. In French, German, and Spanish, there is tu, tu, and du. Tu, 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 and tu, du, and tu. I, I, I mixed up the language. <laughs> And in German, there's even a, a phrase um, to reflect this. Dauphinger and Ordeduz may we call each other do because it's more personal, more intimate. Um, so we have for hundreds of years used a plural pronoun to speak to individuals. My personal belief, you know, 20 years ago, we said somebody left his book. 10 years ago, we said somebody left his or her book. <laughs> now we say somebody left their book. Yeah. And nobody thinks twice about it. Um, language evolves and it has to re evolve to reflect today's reality. And today's reality is that we don't have a separate pronoun for people who don't fit he and she. And what has been adopted is they. And if somebody wants me to call them they, I'm going to do it because that's respecting who they are. 
All right, I promise I will come back to the name Deborah. Um, this leads us starting into a different direction. When I was in high school, I had my first inklings that someday I might want to end up in the ministry. But I just wasn't really sure at that point. In fact, I went to college and majored in German. Um, but I was entertaining the idea, possibility. And I spoke to the keynote speaker at uh, Senior High Conference. And I asked him what he thought about women in the ministry. Because keep in mind, this is back in the 70s. Um, not nearly as common as it is now. And he said, well, in another church, I don't have a problem with it. But in the Presbyterian church, preachers have authority, pastors have authority, and nowhere in the Bible is a woman who has authority. I don't know if you remember Deborah. <laughs> but Deborah was the judge over all Israel, read the book of Judges, who she was, it's emphasized and, and Austin Harkey gives us the, the example of Deborah in the Bible. She is emphasized as a mother and a wife and a prophet. And Barak would not lead the army of Israel into battle unless she was by his side. So she was a wife, a mother, a prophet, a leader, and a military I wanted to, although at that time I was still a fairly polite child, um, I wanted to just look at him and say, my name is Deborah. And just leave it at that. <laughs> you know, how can you say to somebody whose name is Deborah that the Bible has to give authority to any women? Excuse me. Um, what this does for me now is it makes me say, okay, he thought I should not have the right to fully serve God because of my gender. Now, how can I turn to somebody else and say, well, I don't think you have the right to serve God fully because of your gender. How can I say to somebody else, you are not as wonderfully made as I am? Um, gender, just simply being female, used to, to be a huge barrier in the way of women serving in the ministry. And now gender of a different sort is creating a barrier between for people who are seeking to serve God fully. <laughs> okay, so this takes us far too quickly to um, the, another very important theme in, in Austin's book, which is being created in the image of God. Oh, shoot, I lost the. Um, Austin takes the first and second chapters of Genesis to talk about this. And he talks about how everything is grouped into dualities. Um, God created the light and the darkness. God created the earth, the dry land, and the seas. And he makes the wonderful point does this mean that God, God didn't create the marshes? Because they are neither dry land nor sea. God didn't create the dawn and the dusk because they are neither day nor night, neither light nor dark. 
we refer to Jesus as the Alpha and Omega, which we understand well to mean that God is, that, that Jesus is not just the beginning and the end, but everything in between. So why do we then take God created them male and female to mean male and female? And anything in between is against the good creation of God. And I, I want to say not just between, but beyond. Um, I've always talked about God transcends sex. God transcends gender. It's not that God is neither male nor female. It's that God is something more. And God's creation is something more. Um, uh, he quotes M. Barton, um, who says, uh, based on the dualities we've seen in this chapter, Genesis 1, it's not surprising to find humans broken into two groups here, male and female, God created them. But this verse does not discredit other sexes or genders any more than the verse about the separation of day from night rejects the existence of dawn and dusk. As M. Barclay puts it, this chapter talks about night and day and land and water, but we have dusk and we have marshes. These verses don't mean there's only land and water and there's nowhere where these two meet. These binaries aren't meant to speak to all of reality. They invite us into thinking about everything between and beyond. Um, and, and Austin says uh, that Genesis 1 is using this poetic device to corral the infinite diversity of creation into categories we easily understand. Now, I was privileged to be invited to the support group Friday night. Um, and I said, I felt like a little bit like a party crasher. I, I said that there were so many people here that I love and whose children I know. And um, so I was honored to be included as a part of that and, and hope to continue. Um, but I was sitting next to, to someone who said, I'm a biologist and I love the diversity of the world. I love that we cannot begin to categorize everything. Uh, Austin says that if the author of Genesis wanted to list everything that God created, it would have taken 10,000 scrolls. Um, I love the diversity, and that diversity extends to people. People are diverse, and that is a part of God's wonderful and good creation. And I said to her, can you come help me teach Sunday school? <laughs> That's exactly what I was trying to express. Um, so if if our image, if our understanding of the image of God is just male or female, how small is our God? How very teeny tiny is our God? I'm going to give you another example from my life that may help you clarify this I had difficulty in a church that I was serving with a particular gentleman who informed me at some point finally that he was disgusted to see me behind the pulpit because the person behind the pulpit is supposed to represent Christ and Jesus Christ was not filled with life. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. He didn't have any problem with me being a woman. Jesus Christ was not fat. <laughs> oh, really? We know this from all the pictures we have of Christ. <laughs> no. um, he could not see beyond my appearance to see in me the image of God. I, in his mind, was not able to represent Christ or to fully serve God because I carry extra weight. Um, 
I don't want to do that to anybody else. I cannot, having experienced that, say to somebody else, you are not fit to serve God fully because you were born a man and you dress like a woman. How can we not look beyond that and see the image of God in each and every one of us? One more thing about the image of God is that Jesus talks about the, um, uh, you know, he's asked, do we pay taxes? Is it lawful for us to pay taxes? And he says, whose image is on that, uh, on that point? Caesar's. Okay, then you give to Caesar for the Caesars and give to God for his gods. Whose image is stamped on us? This time is the obvious answer. <laughs> God's, thank you. God's image is stamped on us. Which means, okay, that coin has Caesar stamp, belongs to coin. That to, to, to Caesar was made by Caesar, stamped by Caesar. It's Caesar's. Give it back to Caesar. We are stamped with God's image. And that doesn't have nearly as much to do with how we look as it has to do with to whom we belong. We are all created in the image of God, which means that we belong to God in a way that goes far beyond ownership. We belong to God. And what would, you know, the whole purpose of the study is to talk about how our church can be welcoming and affirming to all people, not just varying genders, not just varying ways, uh, <laughs> but to every unique person. What would our church look like? What would our lives look like? What would our world look like if we truly saw the image of God in every person? How could we just throw away these wonderful images of God and put them in the trash and say they are worthless? How could we do that? Um, I have covered so little, but the choir has to leave in two minutes. And I'm in the choir, so I have to leave in two minutes. So I want to, to go back and just once again leave you with Psalm 119. One thirty-nine. I knew there was something wrong. I am slightly dyslexic, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> One thirty-nine. <laughs> Thirteen and fourteen. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. I have just time to close this with prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we have had and will continue to have to discuss what it means to be made in your image, to be made by you, and to be loved and cherished by you. Thank you for all of your children, precious gifts, uniquely, awesomely, wonderfully made, stamped with your image. Help us to see each beloved child through your eyes. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for letting me share with you some of my journey. I hope that it helps others. Thank you, Debbie, so much.